I'm gonna start on the board actually. What's that? I'm gonna start here. Right. Yeah, that's why. Okay. Shall I go ahead and introduce you? Sure. Good morning, everyone. We'll continue today with Isabel Garcia Garcia, who's going to be telling us a little bit, I believe, about topological things like cosmic strings today. Okay. Yeah. So last time, um, so last lecture, we left off by discussing uh, defects, in particular domain walls that arise in the context of a spontaneously broken um, discrete symmetry. So we looked at the particular example of uh, a global C2 symmetry, and we sort of argued our way to the existence of certain field configurations that are two-dimensional that separate sort of the two vacua that are related by the C2 symmetry uh, and are characterized by both, by basically a region of size L set by the quantum wavelength of the relevant particle in the theory uh, and with a, certain, with a certain characteristic tension set by the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so this is a very generic statement. Uh, theories that have a spontaneous breaking of discrete symmetries will typically feature defects of this kind. Um, to connect a little bit with what we discussed uh, in, in some of the previous lectures, this guy, which is, you know, which transforms as a pseudo-scalar under, under the C2 symmetry, this field could be, for example, in some UV completion, the field that is responsible for a spontaneously breaking parity uh, in our world. So if the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, say, was uh, what, what we were calling B prime in some of our previous lectures, and if we introduce an interaction with a dimensionful coupling between this pseudo-scalar and our Higgses in the standard model and mirror sectors, so notice uh, if phi transforms as a pseudo-scalar under parity, and remember parity switch H and H prime, this is a parity invariant interaction. However, when phi gets a vacuum expectation value, uh, this will look like a parity breaking uh, mass square term in the Lagrangian. So the discussion we had previously of introducing just by hand kind of a soft breaking of parity could be realized by you know, a simple kind of uh, interaction with, with the pseudo-scalar like this. So, you know, again, this is a very generic statement uh, about the existence of domain walls in theories with spontaneously broken discrete symmetries. An example of that would be, for instance, theories where, where parity is spontaneously broken, okay? Similarly, uh, in this case, actually, this bev would actually break both P and CP as well. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I said, this is like a, a more general statement. Uh, and uh, just for, for a reminder, and just to have it on the blackboard, uh, we sort of estimated what the total sort of energy or of one of these objects would be. So we said, you know, it would be proportional to the area of this guy times its tension. And we saw that that had to be, you know, at the very least bigger than V over root lambda, where, where lambda is this coupling. Uh, so this is an object that is well above, you know, the effective theory regime, uh, the low energy regime of this, of this model, so extremely heavy. Um, okay, so we are going to now do kind of a simple modification of the theory we've been looking at by just turning this guy uh, into a complex scalar, okay? So what happens if um, so all I'm going to do is, you know, turn this guy into a complex scalar field with some potential that is spontaneously breaks. Uh, in this case, uh, the sorry, the U1 symmetry. So there's a, I'm going to take it to be a global symmetry for now. We'll discuss what happens in the cage of a, of a U1 gauge theory. So, and in this case, this theory very obviously has a symmetry which is shifts phi by, by a phase. So what we're going to see is that a theory like this, where there is a spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry, in particular a U1 uh, global symmetry, can have defects which are typically go by the name of uh, cosmic strings, uh, also known as, in some contexts, vortices. 
so you can think uh, so similar to you know the way we were thinking about these parity solutions. Sorry, these uh, C2 solutions as perhaps to do with you know parity breaking. If you want, you could have in the back of your mind you know this complex field could be the Petra Queen field um, that we introduce, for example, in the context of uh, axiom models, where the face of this field could be could be the axiom. Okay. Again, this is more generally true for for a you know, white class of theories that have uh, spontaneously broken continuous symmetries. So in this case, the scalar potential looks kind of, well, this is really the real part of phi. As you're familiar with this, uh, you know, wine bottle type potential since this guy cannot have real and imaginary parts. Um, so the vacuum uh, of this theory is actually comprised by an infinite number of the inner vacua. So infinite number of vacua. And all of those different vacua are parameterized by the phase of, of phi, okay? So, and you can think of this as sort of like the orientation of, of the field uh, in the plane of like, you know, real and, and imaginary uh, values of phi. So, again, uh, the perturbative spectrum as you know, in this case, uh, comprises a massless number Goldstone boson if the symmetry is exact. You know, you can think of the axiom. There's also a massive radial mode with mass of order root lambda times f. Uh, and that's it for now uh, if, the, if the symmetry is just a global symmetry. So we want to look for solitons again. And so does this theory, can this theory uh, sustain uh, soliton solutions? And it's useful to think about how we found uh, the soliton solutions of, of uh, the spontaneously broken C2 symmetry yesterday, okay? The key to finding the solutions was to consider field configurations where at the spatial infinity, the field took, uh, took the value uh, of the, of the sort of degenerate vacua, the different degenerate vacua at different parts of spatial infinity, okay? That is the thing that kind of precluded us from being able to deform that field configuration to one of the completely uh, homogeneous, homogeneous vacua. So similarly, uh, in this case, it seems reasonable to look for field configurations where now the orientation of phi varies at a spatial infinity. Uh, yeah, and it turns out uh, this is possible if these solutions are localized this time not along one direction, uh, as, in the, as in the domain wall case, uh, but localized in, in, in a, in a two-dimensional plane. And we'll take that to be with our local generality, loss of generality, uh, the xy plane. So, okay, so let me, uh, so let me start by just writing, you know, what the energy of a static field configuration would be. This is just a trivial exercise, kind of same thing we did yesterday. So one term will be the gradient uh, of, the, of the scalar field, and then all we have is the contribution from the potential. So we're going to be looking for solutions that are localized in two dimensions, therefore, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna integrate over, over the C direction. Uh, so LC would be sort of like the length of this object uh, on the C direction, and then I get an integral over the xy plane, which for convenience I'm going to write in polar coordinates on the plane, and then I get 
some radial derivative, also crucially, an angular derivative, as well as, again, the potential term. Okay. So now we want to look for solutions where the energy per unit length of this object, what I'm going to call the tension, uh, for reasons that I feel like are obvious at this point. Uh, so for this object to be finite, we need that, you know, the mod of phi obviously has to go to f over root two so that the potential is zero all the way at r, r goes to infinity, okay? So, yeah, so let me actually, let me actually write it in this way. So phi has to go as r goes to infinity. Its mod has to go to uh, f on root two, but then the phase can be general. Now, if we just wrote something like, you know, constant phase, this would just be, you know, there are very many infinite different vacua that can exist in this theory. And, you know, each of these guys are a good solution kind of everywhere in the, in the plane. We are looking for solutions where the orientation of phi or, you know, the phase of phi actually varies at the spatial infinity, okay? And notice we are actually perfectly allowed to consider some function of theta in the exponent, okay? Now, we cannot, you know, just consider any random function of, function of theta. Uh, this guy uh, in the sort of the circle at infinity must remain single value. which restricts a little bit the types of function we can take so that if we do a two pi rotation of physical space, we can only change the value of this phase by a multiple of, by a multiple of two pi, okay? So that's a minor, some minor restriction on, on the types of phases we can consider. Uh, but actually, yeah, with a loss of generality, you might actually consider this to be itself an integer times theta. So for example, let me actually draw this uh, and it'll hopefully we can clear. So let me just do it for n equals one. Um, so this is our xy plane. The c direction is coming this way and you can just imagine like, you know, the solution is like, you know, independent, independent of c. Uh, so at little r goes to infinity, so at the spatial infinity on the circle, we've considered sort of field configurations where, uh, you know, phi has this form. And I can draw that, uh, so I can draw the orientation of phi on the, on the actual physical plane in the following manner. So if I think of like phi as, you know, a vector with real and imaginary parts uh, in the usual way. So, you know, along this axis, it would just be real. Along this axis, it would be real with a minus sign. Here, it would be pure imaginary. Here, it would be pure imaginary with a minus sign. And sort of, you can convince yourself that this field configuration corresponds to the orientation of phi winding around the physical, uh, the physical circle at infinity as you go around, okay? So this is what this field configuration is doing. As we wind around uh, two pi in physical space, the field itself winds one. Obviously, you know, if we generalize this to uh, number n, this would be a configuration with winding number n, which means like, you know, one loop around physical space would do a rotation in field space n times. Okay. Um, now, so we can consider sort of this, you know, this field configuration. Uh, so sort of this is, you know, the S1 at spatial infinity. There's no reason why, you know, this, this cannot be also true somewhere kind of closer to the center of the plane. However, it is clear that this cannot be a solution everywhere on the plane, okay? If it was, if it was like this everywhere on the plane, uh, the phase in particular would be discontinuous. Uh, R equals to zero, okay? So 
for that not to be the case, uh, the, the phase of phi, so argument of phi necessarily must be ill-defined somewhere on the plane, which is to say that there needs to be some region where actually uh, the, the variable of phi, sort of the mode of phi actually vanishes, okay? And I'm going to qualitatively just draw that at some, you know, some region around the, around the origin where, where the bevel phi exactly vanishes, okay? So there is some tiny region in the plane where the U1 global symmetry is actually restored, okay? And elsewhere, in particular, asymptotically, we have this non-trivial non -trivial sort of uh, winding, winding topology. So, <clears throat> yeah, so if you want to visualize this uh, in three spatial dimensions, so we've been sort of concentrating on, on the XY plane, we said there is some, you know, some small region of the plane where like the U1 symmetry is restored. Uh, and this just trivially extends in the C direction. Trivially, okay, so this is exactly uh, a sort of one dimensional object approximately, uh, which is what goes by the name of, of a cosmic string, okay. And again, uh, there can be other types of defects like for example, monopoles and things like this that also arise when you have uh, a spontaneous breaking of continuous symmetries, uh, but cosmic strings are, are one such, and in particular, they arise in the, in the simplest case of a spontaneously, a spontaneously broken uh, U1. So, okay, so let's do uh, something similar to what we did yesterday. In ter we're gonna try to find some more features of these, these defects, these cosmic strings, not by trying to solve you know, exactly the field equations, but we're gonna do it sort of like the dirty way uh, by sort of making an ansatz and then you know, trying to find out what the reasonable values of the relevant parameters are. Here, you know, the things we want to find out uh, that set sort of the physics of this object are going to be the radius, sort of like the thickness of this region, uh, as well as, again, uh, the tension of these, of these cosmic strings. So, so we're gonna make uh, A pretty simple answer uh, based on our picture. So the solution is independent of the C coordinate, and we're gonna take it to be zero in some region of the plane for little r smaller than some capital R radius, and then f on root two e to the i theta, so it's asymptotic value for larger values of r, okay? This is the literally, you know, dumbest thing we could have written based on our picture. So let us now, uh, let me write it here. So let us now uh, evaluate uh, for these ansatz the value of that uh, string tension, sort of like energy per, per unit length that we wrote earlier on. So there are uh, three different terms here. So there is a, a radial derivative term. So as we go across the plane, uh, the value of phi mod phi changes by roughly f uh, over a distance big R, and then we're integrating this over a region uh, pi R square, so this turns out to be independent of big R. We're actually not gonna care about this term as much. Um, there's also another term that comes from the potential, so the fact that phi is at zero uh, uh, in, the, in, this, in this region around the center of the plane means that the potential actually contributes uh, by, uh, by this amount, uh, multiply again by sort of the area of the small circle. So we get this from, from the, the value of the field in the center of the plane. And then, crucially, uh, there, there is this contribution from the angular derivative of phi. So, okay, so, that means, yeah, so the, so because we're sort of using these, uh, these ansatz, uh, d theta of phi is just gonna give us uh, f, f on root two. Uh, we have a factor of r from the, so we have 
Yeah, okay, so we have a factor, so let's do, we've already done the integral over theta, we have a factor of r from the, from the integration measure, uh, also the one over r from the derivative in, in radial coordinates, and then a factor of f squared just yes, from, the, from the angular derivative itself. So notice that this, this piece actually goes like integral of one over r. Okay, and this is non-zero whenever there is uh, a non-zero bef for, for phi, so this integral actually goes from little r all the way to formally infinity. So you already see that there is some issue here in that uh, the second term actually diverges logarithmically. Okay, so what you're seeing here is that, strictly speaking, it is actually not possible to find field configurations with finite tension if the symmetry is global. I'm gonna cheat a little bit for now. I'm just gonna, you know, just take some IR cutoff uh, and, and put a bound to that uh, logarithmic divergence. Uh, and I'm going to estimate uh, the second term as pi f square and then log of d over d over r. And then again, formally, uh, you know, formally we would say this means there are no finite energy free configurations. Uh, Sometimes this appears in the books by the name of Derrick's theorem, uh, but we see that this is actually not all that important uh, in physical situations. I'll discuss this in a, in a second. Now, just like before, uh, we can find out what the typical radius of the thickness, rather, of, of the cosmic string is. So, dt dr, uh, yeah, so the first term doesn't depend on uh, so we get this from this actually minus, and then also from the potential, something of order pi r lambda v to the fourth. Um, and yeah, overall the typical radius of this of this object is actually for the root lambda times the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, which similar to our discussion yesterday, in this case is given by the quantum wavelength of the radial mode, okay? And now, if we evaluate the tension for this, uh, for this radius, we find pi f square log, again, our, our infrared cutoff distance divided by the quantum wavelength of, the, of, this, uh, of the radial mode. And as I said, if we were to take this to infinity, we, we will conclude that this object, uh, these objects have, must have uh, finite tension. So, yeah, so the tension of a global string formally is formally log divergent. But in physical situations, what you actually encounter is not, you know, an isolated string uh, of infinite distance, but is either, and by physical situations, I mostly have in mind, uh, you know, in the context of cosmology, but also actually in the context of condensed matter, and some of you may be more familiar with that. So what you typically encounter is either a network of strings. So again, if we are looking at this from like uh, a section of the of the string, sort of on the xy plane, you know, a network of strings we typically uh, Com comprise uh, strings of different winding numbers. So perhaps, you know, we have one string with unit number one, and then there could also be, uh, so this would be like the unit vortex. We could also have typically uh, an anti-vortex. Uh, so what you see here is that in these situations, the phase, the orientation of the field doesn't actually wind all the way, uh, all the way out to each spatial infinity, but it only really winds uh, in the distance sort of like between the strings. So for example, in a network of cosmic strings, there is a physical IR cutoff, which is given to you by sort of like the typical distance between, between the defects, okay? And that typically is set by whatever production mechanism led to, to these strings, for instance, in the early universe. I'll mention that a little bit later on. And then another possibility um, that also happens in cosmology is if instead of sort of like a long cosmic string, you have uh, a string loop, okay? And in this case, uh, the, the typical IR cutoff is just sort of like the typical radius, typical size of this, of this loop. 
So in physical situations, even though formally it looks like, you know, there are no finite energy uh, free configurations, and you know, it sort of like doesn't make sense. Uh, in in reality, uh, you know, that's sort of like it's a bit of a of a red herring. Um, and uh, as we will see later on, um, in cosmology in particular, this infrared cutoff uh, could be as large as the the Hubble radius um, in the early universe. We'll we'll discuss a little bit more about that about that later. Okay, so that's sort of like the basics of uh, global cosmic strings. Let me say a little bit more about two uh, types of strings that are common in, you know, in many extensions of the standard model. One is going to be what you know we typically call uh, PQ strings. So the types of strings that arise in theories of of the QCD axiom. Um, so we already discussed earlier that you know the, the QCD action solution requires introducing this G1 PQ symmetry that is spontaneously broken. So that immediately tells us that there is going to be defects of this form, so a string like defects. But the situation is actually uh, a little more rich in, in practice. And so let me illustrate that uh, with an example. Yeah, so, so after a spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, of, the, of the U1 PQ symmetry, the fact that you know, there is a massless uh, Goldstone boson is reflected by the fact that the axion has uh, a shift symmetry, okay, where you know, really uh, you know, alpha is uh, an angular variable that goes from 0, 0, and 2 pi. Now, we discussed early on when we were discussing uh, QCD axion solutions to, to the strength CP problem that uh, QCD instantons break explicitly uh, the U1 Petri Queen, or in other words, uh, the axion shift symmetry, if you want, in the, in the IR. Okay, and we said that that uh, Petra Queen breaking interaction, so the action is given by so it's a coupling between the axion and trace GG dual, and I told you at the time that this typically comes with a coefficient of this form, where okay, this is the usual g square on 32 pi square, uh, and this is an integer, okay? So this overall factor here uh, is the anomaly coefficient of whatever heavy fermions are charged under the U1 PQ symmetry that you've integrated out in order to, to generate a term like this, okay? So in, in actual Juby completions of the QCD axion, uh, the, this term comes uh, with, with this sort of integer in front that, you know, is model dependent, so it depends on whatever way you sort of uh, choose to you be complete the the your axiom model. I think probably Masha mentioned the sort of two standard uh, UB completions by Kim Weinstein, Sifman, uh, Sakharov, and also uh, Michael Dine and collaborators. Um, so those are the two kind of general uh, UB completions, and the values of n in those two theories are slightly different. Okay, so we're just going to consider this. A little bit more, uh, more generally. Now, so what happens when uh, we do a, a PQ transformation uh, of the axion? So a shift, a shift of the axion uh, when we have a term like this. So the action, the, the action uh, now transforms as. Um, so if I shift the axion uh, like this, this transforms in the in the following way. G square on say two pi square trace G G dual. Uh, but I told you earlier on that actually uh, uh, the feature of instantons is that this guy is quantized uh, on the integers. Okay. So what I want to draw your attention to is that 
the action remains invariant under, uh, uh, under a shift symmetry of the action for certain values of alpha, where alpha times big N is actually uh, an integer multiple of, of 2 pi N. Okay, so even though QCD does break explicitly the U1 PQ symmetry and therefore the shift symmetry of the axiom, if this integer is not unity, is some other value, then there is actually a discrete CN uh, subgroup of the of the uh, U1 PQ symmetry that, that is left unbroken by QCD, okay? So again, for any generic value of alpha, the action wouldn't be invariant uh, under a shift symmetry of the axion, but if alpha has these special values, uh, then, then it will be. So in general, We have various things going on, and this is also true, you know, more generally in theories with large uh, continuous symmetries. So we have the non-zero BEV of the Petra Queen field, if you want, breaking this down to uh, a CN global symmetry. And then uh, once uh, the once the axiom gets a vacuum expectation value, it will spontaneously break. Uh, it will spontaneously break the the ZN symmetry, okay? So this is a theory that has both cosmic strings, but also domain walls associated to the breaking of the leftover uh, discrete symmetry. So, okay, so let me... So what I was saying is that low energies, meaning you know well below the QCD scale, uh, the action gets a vacuum expectation value, and this guy is now spontaneously broken uh, completely. And so <coughs> this theory also contains what we call sort of axiom domain walls. And again, sort of an analysis from the Carroll Lagrangian uh, will tell you that, you know, this, this axiom domain walls carry tension so further the QCD energy density uh, divided by, by the axiom mass. Um, so let us, let us just think for a second uh, in these kind of situations where you have this multiple patterns of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, you know, what happens as you go around uh, a PQ string, okay? So if n was equal to one and the U1 pitch queen symmetry was just broken all the way to nothing, uh, immediately we would just have, you know, our picture of the cosmic string with some thickness and, uh, you know, the face of phi would just wind by, you know, two pi as we go around the circle at infinity. Um, so, yeah, two pi rotation. So yeah, a two pi rotation in physical space always have to lead to an integer number of windings of uh, the PQ field phi. So at uh, energies that are well above uh, the QCD scale, uh, yeah, all we have is you know the usual the usual cosmic string behavior that we described earlier, uh, but at low energies. We are actually only allowed to have a certain discrete set of faces for for a scalar field uh, at infinity. Okay, so this has to be not just any uh, you know any phase, but uh, something that is sort of you know square root of unity uh, in this in this manner. So what we find is that actually in the IR for this type of strings, 
the phase of phi actually needs to jump between these discrete values as we go around the circle in, in physical space, okay? So phase of phi must quote unquote jump between discrete values. Um, however, the field itself must remain continuous as we do uh, these operations. So let's say, you know, we start in this region where, you know, the, the little n is equal to zero. So here we would say like the the web of the axion is zero. Uh, let's say we're doing this for uh, n equals three, where you know the various phases are sort of integer units of two pi on three. And we need to get back to you know two pi on the way on the way around. So there, there has to be some other region where this is uh, a is two pi on three, some other region where a is uh, four pi on three, and then eventually we go back to uh, you know six pi on three, which is which is two pi. Now for this to be possible in a way that is continuous, uh, there needs to be uh, a region here where the axion actually passes by, um, I should have made this, let me actually draw something first. Um, what I'm going to say is that all of those values of uh, the axiom bev are values where the potential is minimized when there is a ZN symmetry left unbroken after a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in order to continuously transition from one value to the other, the field is gonna have to pass by a region where the potential is not minimized, okay? So this, this region of transition are actually regions where some, you know, some amount of energy density is, is localized. And this sort of becomes more obvious. Uh, I should have drawn this earlier on, I forgot. Uh, so the QCD axiom potential uh, as a function of n. So let me let me draw the sort of vanilla case where the axiom is one uh, a over f. So yeah, the fundamental domain of the axiom is from zero to two pi. If n was equals to one, we would have a single vacuum. Two pi and zero are the same. Uh, so nothing interesting here. But let's say uh, n is three. This is what the actual potential for the axiom looks like. Uh, B of A, this is also B of A. Okay, so this will correspond to a situation where the action potential looks more like this. Again, zero and two pi are the same thing, but we have, you know, this intermediate vacua. And the action by taking any of these values is what breaks the, the C3 symmetry of the theory, okay? So what we're saying is that as we go around the, the PQ string in physical space, uh, the axion is first in one of these vacua, it has to transition to perhaps there is the second vacua, and then again to the third vacua until it comes back to this place, which is to say that you know, these transitions are actually, uh, they correspond to axion domain walls, okay? So attached to these strings, there are these two dimensional sheets where the action is going over the hump uh, of this potential. Uh, and these are sort of like two dimensional objects that are attached to this, to this string. Okay, this is a bit messy. If you look at this kind of, again, from the top, like if you're looking at the string from kind of above, you have you know, the vortex there sitting in the, in the XY plane. And then you have these like cosmic strings attached to it. Uh, where you know the axiom bev, so the phase of the field sort of takes these discrete values, but it does so continuously by my mover over by moving over the scalar potential, and then you end up with this this cosmic string. Oh, sorry, these domain walls. Yeah, so in the, if you end up with the situation, so typically, you know, there's going to be some hierarchy between the scalar spontaneous symmetry breaking of the U1 and the QCD scale. So typically what happens is, you know, once that, once that U1 gets spontaneously broken, 
a network of strings will form, and it will act as, as if there were no domain walls, because the CN is not just spontaneously broken. And then much later, uh, if there are still strings around uh, at the QCD transition, uh, you know, confinement scale, then these domain walls will form. OK, and then. It is actually, I don't know if Masha actually uh, mentioned this in her talk. So as you know, the QCD action is also an excellent dark matter candidate. Uh, and one of the ways uh, enough uh, action energy density can be produced to be the dark matter is through the case uh, of, of cosmic strings of this type into actions, OK? So the final answer of like how much actions are produced in the early universe through this type of mechanism uh, it's actually extremely complicated. So, you know, you just take one cosmic string and you look at, you know, what the effective action is for how it moves, and you find, oh, this is simple. Like, I get the number goto action, so we're done. But actually, when you have a bunch of strings in the universe, all of which are interacting with each other, that is actually a very difficult problem. Uh, and so, this is something you know people are still are still trying to understand more in general, like how you know a network of strings behaves. Uh, you know, how a network of strings coupled to domain walls behave. Uh, this this is a sort of an object that is actually much harder to get rid of in the early universe than just uh, strings by themselves. So, so yeah, this is very much uh, a, you know, a very active area of research. Uh, and you know, we've had in mind, in the back of our mind, sort of like the Petrequin action, just to have something concrete uh, in mind. But again, these types of you know, topological defects, and in particular, these sort of like uh, hybrid defects are extremely common in theories with you know, spontaneous breaking of of large symmetries. Um, so what I want to uh, do uh, at the end of today and also tomorrow is, you know, I've told you like, you know, these objects have some large tension typically uh, by, you know, the EFT standards. Uh, they can also be huge. So like the overall quote unquote mass of one of these objects is just, you know, some completely ridiculous thing that you're never going to produce in the lab, right? So you know, why am I talking about all of this stuff if we are never going to produce these guys? Uh, the answer is that in order to produce objects like this, you need a phase transition to happen. And that is something that can happen in the context of cosmology as the universe sort of cools down uh, after, after the Big Bang. So one of the things I want to discuss uh, starting later today is how at finite temperatures, symmetries get restored and how that process of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking as the temperature drops leads to, generically, uh, the production of, of these types of defects uh, through a mechanism that is actually very simple, to, very simple to understand. So that's kind of where we're going. Before we do that, I feel like there is one more type of cosmic strings that I need to tell you about uh, for general culture purposes, which are uh, strings that are produced when we have not just a U1 global symmetry, but a U1 gauge theory, OK? So those are special types of strings uh, that go by the name sometimes of nielsen olsen strings or nielsen olsen vertex uh, that have also a strong similarities with um, you know, vortex defects in certain condensed matter systems and, and superconductors uh, more generally. So let's discuss that before we move on to uh, symmetry restoration at finite temperature. So I'm just going to take, um, so this is going to be a billion Higgs model. So we're just gonna do. Uh, we're gonna take the theory we already have. So, but we're just gonna add uh, a U1 gate factor, and now our field carries charge under under that U1. Okay, uh, minus VFI, and so this guy just carries some um, charge G under under the U1. So again, after a spontaneous symmetry breaking. We have perturbatively both a radial mode as well as now instead of a goldstone, we just have a massive vector with mass of order g times g times the f. Let's do the same thing. So we're going to look for static field configurations with uh, finite tension. Uh, 
And a static now means also that not just the time derivatives of phi are zero, but also the time derivatives of uh, the, the vector field at zero. So, okay, so f not i is zero, which means we're gonna look for field configurations with uh, zero, zero electric field, uh, but oops, in general, um, in general, you know, non-zero magnetic field. So we can write that as, again, these three x. And then everything else is sort of like the same as before. Okay. Now there is a crucial uh, observation. Uh, so before, you know, when we were looking at the global string, we had this issue with the, um, the angular derivative of the field that was giving us this logarithmic divergence, okay? Notice that now, because this is a covariant derivative, uh, you know, this is really, there's an extra term here that comes from a theta, um, yeah, the theta, the theta component of the, of the vector field, okay? So now, uh, notice that we can actually make uh, these, this gradient term finite, so we can now have finite energy if this guy, as we go to a spatial infinity, goes to zero, okay? Uh, and we can do that if the behavior of a theta, uh, a spatial infinity, actually matches uh, the gradient of, of the scalar field. So write as d theta over r, okay? So actually having a non-trivial kind of behavior of uh, the vector field at infinity now allow us to kind of circumvent that kind of logarithmic divergence annoyance that we had uh, for the case of the, of the global strings. Notice that uh, this form of um, this uh, expression for A, I can write it in the following way. Uh, so at R goes to infinity, I can write it like this, where this function alpha of x is just, uh, you know, this function of, of theta over uh, the gauge coupling. So, at infinity, what we're actually demanding is that the, the vector field is pure gauge. Which also makes sure that all the components of f mu nu uh, are zero, uh, again, only at the spatial infinity. So there's no magnetic field also at the spatial infinity. We've made this guy zero at the spatial infinity and therefore finite energy. And then, you know, this is also zero at infinity because you know, the model of the field is going to, to its asymptotic path. So we've actually now convinced ourselves that once we have a gauge field around, there can be strings with real, you know, honest, uh, finite, finite tension. However, uh, the fact that, you know, the field is pure gauge at infinity and there are no magnetic field uh, asymptotically doesn't mean that that has to be true everywhere, okay? And we can actually find that out by, um, actually just computing how much magnetic flux is going through is thread in the plane, the xy plane, in the presence of, of one of these solutions, okay? And we actually don't need to know uh, anything else than what we already know, so magnetic flux on the plane is just the integral on the plane of B, okay? Kind of by definition, so this could be an integral over the entire plane. Uh, we can use Stokes theorem to relate this to the line integral of our, our vector field A uh, on the circle at a spatial infinity. Okay, so I should, I should actually, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is the circle at the spatial infinity. So I'm gonna write this as limit when R goes to infinity uh, two pi. And then a theta uh, 
So a theta has this uh, behavior at spatial infinity. Notice this, this uh, factor of r here cancels with r, and then all we get is like the integral over theta of this derivative of theta. Okay, so all we get is actually just uh, I'm like missing factors of g. Yes. All we get is uh, the difference in uh, in the vorticity, you know, the phase of the scalar field. Uh, between 0 and 2 pi, which, as we said earlier, has to be an integer multiple of 2 pi. So what we learn is that, in fact, there is non-zero magnetic field uh, going along the plane in the presence of one of these solutions. But moreover, magnetic field, magnetic flux is quantized in units of 2 pi on g, OK? Yeah, so unlike a global string, uh, sort of a gauge cosmic string, it's threaded by magnetic flux. So now it's sort of more like there's an object with some tension, and then inside the string, there is lines of lines of uh, confined uh, magnetic field. So I'm going, only going to sketch uh, you know, how you go around finding the properties uh, of the solution, sort of more generally. Uh, Yeah, so this tells us in particular that even if uh, the vector field is pure gauge asymptotically, it cannot be pure gauge everywhere, okay? There needs to be a region where f mu nu is non-zero. And again, and I'll leave this uh, mostly as an exercise, but if you start with an ansatz, you know, similar to uh, what we had before, so. Now we have to introduce sort of two land scales. Uh, depending on, you know, to parameterize the behavior of the, the scalar field and the vector. And let me consider actually end units of vorticity. We can also, uh, yeah, take an ansatz for the magnetic field along the C direction. Uh, we can just assume, so we know it's zero asymptotically, so we're just gonna assume it stays zero for some R larger than Rb. Uh, and then we're just going to assume that it stays constant equal to, you know, the flux uh, 2 pi and on g divided by some area for r smaller than rv, okay? So if you do all of this uh, and you evaluate the various terms in in this uh, in this expression uh, with that answer, so now you have you know magnetic field as well. Uh, what you find is so there's going to be a turn from the you know that magnetic flex that you can write like this. So this is just b square area. Uh, the radial part we can forget about it and. Now, uh, the angular derivative part has a built-in infrared cutoff, which is the typical radius uh, that we've associated to the, to the vector sector. Uh, so now this is dr, 1 over r. So now this actually just, uh, it still has a log, but notice it's no longer an infinite log. Okay, and then finally, as well, the contribution from the scalar field. Sorry, from the potential. So you can minimize this expression relative to, you know, the two typical radiuses we have here. And then, as unsurprisingly, you find that Rs is set, again, by the quantum wavelength of the scalar field. Rb is set by the quantum wavelength of uh, the vector field. And actually, to be completely honest, uh, I've done this kind of assuming that 
RB is larger than RS, you can also do uh, the opposite case. So this basically corresponds to you know heavier scalar compared to the vector, which is also a natural kind of expectation. And then if you evaluate the tension of this string, what you find is for n units of uh, of magnetic flux, uh, yeah, this is logarithmically enhanced, but now uh, finite. Okay. Notice though that. So the tension of a string that carries n units of magnetic flux is proportional to n squared. By contrast, if I had just taken n cosmic strings, each of which is carrying one unit of magnetic flux, my total, the total tension of the system would just be linear in n, okay? So what this tells you, uh, among other things, is that a system with you know, a single cosmic string with n units of flux is actually unstable to decay into n units, n different uh, n cosmic strings, each carrying, carrying one, uh, one unit of flux. So only uh, n equals one string is stable. Uh, and this, is, uh, this will be familiar, I guess, to some of you uh, in the sense that this is sort of like the relativistic version of a type two Superconductor, okay, where also vortices with with uh, unit vortices are actually the only the only stable ones. Uh, higher winding is always always the case to the unit vortex. And then if you look uh, at the case where, if you look at the opposite case where the vector is heavier than the scalar, and therefore R S is smaller than R V, that has a slightly different properties, uh, and that mimics what what would be the type one uh, superconductor, the relativistic version of it. Uh, so yeah, that's all I'm going to say about like you know the main walls cosmic strings. Uh, this is a you know these defects have a very rich uh, very rich physics. Uh, there are a ton more things I could say uh, about them. For instance, you know in the case of the the action strings, by definition because the the relevant you want symmetry is anomalous. There are always a number of fermions that become massless uh, on on the string background. Okay, so these are necessarily what we call superconducting strings, uh, where certain zero modes are localized on those strings. The dynamics of those objects are still, uh, you know, understanding that and what that means for fermionology is still kind of. Uh, there are lots of open, interesting, interesting questions. So, so I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, you know, beyond this, beyond this uh, defects. You know, you probably also have heard about, uh, you know, monopoles. Uh, these are also defects that are typically formed in continuous, in spontaneous breaking continuous symmetries. You know, the story is sort of like very similar, the way you go about finding the solutions and, and whatnot. Uh, what I want to discuss for the, the rest of these lectures, and we're going to, to start a little bit in the last 15 minutes, is more about, okay, you know, we have these, uh, the zoo of topological defects, uh, solitons, that are very generic in theories with the spontaneous breaking of symmetries. Uh, so what about that? Like, what are the what are the implications of that for particle phenomenology and and sort of like the experiments we are we are doing in the in the next couple of decades? So oh, and also let me tell you uh, just briefly before I do that. Like what happens in the standard model, okay? So standard model has like this gauge group, it's spontaneously broken to you want electromagnetism, there are tons of things going on. Uh, does the standard model host any, any of these defects? Do you know the answer? The answer is no, and there's actually a, a very easy way to see that, uh, which is that some of you may be familiar with the fact that in order to sort of decide whether uh, a theory contains topological defects or not, it's useful to look at uh, the vacuum manifold, okay? And actually, I didn't want to do it in this way here, but um, what actually tells us whether there are defects or not is whether you know, the nth homotopy group of this vacuum manifold is, is trivial or non-trivial. So for example, the first homotopy group uh, being, being non-zero tells us uh, the theory contains strings. And what this means uh, is basically whether there exists a map from the vacuum manifold to the S1, the circle, okay? 
So it was obviously it was obviously the case when we were discussing the the global cosmic string. I don't have the black over there, but you know the vacuum manifold was parameterized by the phases of phi. Therefore, the, the vacuum manifold in that case was very obviously a circle. So maps from the circle to the circle in physical space are going to be parameterized by the integers, how many times you wind around. And that's like, you know, that's kind of like the number, uh, the winding number of the different possible cosmic strings. You can also generalize this a little bit for uh, pi naught. So pi naught would be maps from your vacuum manifold to S naught, which is two points. Uh, in our discussion of the domain wall, we had our vacuum manifold actually had two points, which was plus v and minus v. So we had a map from two points to two points. That, and then we have two choices of how to do that, which were like the kink and the anti-kink. Okay, so that would be a C2 in this case. So the standard model uh, is, the vacuum of the standard model uh, is defined by uh, the Higgs getting a non-zero vacuum expectation value. But you know, remember, I'm gonna write this a bit bigger, sorry. So remember, you know, we can always write the Higgs. Uh, it's a, it's a edge to left doublet. I can write it in terms of real and imaginary parts like this. Okay. So I can also write this equation by just saying that the sum of the phi i square has to be v square, which is the same as saying that the vacuum manifold of the standard model it's actually a three sphere. And pi n of S n when, sorry, pi, pi n of S capital N, where little n is smaller than n, is always zero. So there are no domain walls in the standard model. There are no strings in the standard model, although these guys are zero. And also there are no monopoles by itself uh, in the standard model. Any topological defects uh, that we you know, signatures of which we might discover in the context of cosmology will always point to, to physics beyond the standard model necessarily because of this fact, okay? Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so let me introduce, uh, so I'm gonna switch to how these defects may actually be produced at high temperatures. So let us discuss first uh, the topic of how symmetries that are spontaneously broken uh, at zero temperature are restore at high temperatures. Okay, so at t equals zero, we always look for the vacuum by minimizing uh, energy. So, you know, we look for the minimum of the potential. At finite temperature, well, we actually vacuum that minimizes not the energy, but the free energy. Okay? Here it is. So if T is large enough, maximizing entropy, okay, what we typically think of as, you know, disorder phase, it's actually, it can be preferred to minimizing, to minimizing energy, okay? So this is sort of like the very hand wavy qualitative argument to where we expect symmetries to be restored at high temperature. And we're familiar with this, you know, in more in more mundane examples. So okay, so how do we go about uh, understanding this uh, more more professionally? So at, again, at zero temperature, uh, the free energy, actually the free energy density is the, you know, just the effective potential of our field. I'm gonna put a subscript zero now just to emphasize, you know, it's at zero temperature. At, at 
final temperature, this uh, free energy now contains, now it's temperature dependent, and it will contain not just the zero temperature piece, but also any sort of field dependent contributions uh, to the free energy that are dependent on, on the value of phi, both from any fermion, any bosons and fermions in the theory that, that interact with, with our scalar field of interest in some, in some non-trivial way. Okay, so qualitatively, this is how we generalize the zero temperature potential to you know, to the free energy of the, of some, you know, any scalar field of finite temperature. Sometimes this also goes by the name of um, the finite temperature effective potential, okay? VT, VT of phi. Um, okay. And again, these are sort of qualitatively all the, you know, phi dependent uh, contributions to the free energy uh, coming from, you know, your, your particle spectrum, so any bosons and fermions that have interactions with, with phi. So I'm just gonna sketch how, you know, that calculation is done using things you already know. So, um, okay, so remember, from your, you know, undergraduate thermodynamics course, you still remember anything about that? You know, we always computed the free energy by taking some appropriate derivative of the partition function, which is the main object of, of thermodynamics. Uh, and the free energy in particular was just D log, actually D log C in this case, where with a factor of temperature in front, with again where uh, the partition function is just defined as the trace, you know, in full generality of beta h hat is just the uh, Hamiltonian operator, and beta is just notation for inverse temperature, which is, you know, uh, you know the, the classic notation in this context. So this is just the thermodynamic partition function. Okay, so this is how, how we compute the free energy. Uh, let us compute the partition function for a system that, where we know how to do it immediately. So let's consider a single harmonic oscillator. So we're gonna we're gonna perform the trace by summing over all the energy eigenstates, all the Hamiltonian, and we get to sum all occupation numbers because these are bosons all the way from n equals zero uh, to infinity. So here I'm just gonna plug in the fact that Hamiltonian acting on n is just Omega, so the characteristic frequency of that oscillator, n plus one half n, so the one half is the zero point uh, contribution. So we end up with, you know, summing n equals zero to infinity. So we end up with this infinite sum that can actually be done exactly. And you might even remember the final answer from your undergraduate class. Maybe. Uh, so that is the partition function for the single harmonic oscillator. Now taking the log, we get the free energy, which is just, uh, there's a zero point contribution, and then 
there is another part that is temperature dependent times the log of beta omega. Okay. Okay, so that is the single, uh, let me put this down actually, the single harmonic oscillator. So what I'm going to do to tell you uh, what the contribution to the free energy from a scalar field is, I'm just gonna declare that actually a field is a collection of oscillators uh, in the limit of uh, continuum momentum. Uh, and that's gonna give us the right answer, okay? So we've done as much work as we were ever going to do here. So now we're just gonna guess the final answer by taking the right limits. So let me write this here. We're gonna just write the answer for scalar field by you know, using the observation that this is a collection of oscillators uh, so one for each momentum so in that case you know the partition function would just be the product of partition functions uh, labeled by k, and then uh, the contribution to the to the free energy would just be. I'm going to ignore uh, the the zero temperature piece because that's just the zero temperature potential. So I'm just going to write down what happens with the with the temperature dependent piece. Uh, plus, we also want to take the continuum limit. Okay, <clears throat> where we take this sum to be an integral over D3K. And then we also get a factor of a spatial volume <clears throat> to make everything dimensionless. So what you learn is that the free energy density, I'm going to divide by that guy of uh, coming from some real scalar field has the t equals zero piece that I'm not gonna write down, plus this contribution. This is an integral over momenta. Minus e to the minus beta omega k, where, you know, omega k is the usual dispersion relation for say, you know, some relativistic particles. Okay? So we're done, okay? This is like the, the contribution to the free energy density from a scalar field. Again, all we've done is use the fact that the field is a collection of oscillators uh, in, the, in the continuum limit. In the, in the literature very often, so this is not an integral that you can actually do analytically. Uh, this typically is parameterized as t to the fourth, which is some overall scale, and then jb of m squared over t squared. It turns out you can, it's easy to show that um, this integral only depends on the ratio of the mass of the particle to the temperature. You can do the same thing for fermions. Uh, you could do it actually the same way. You need to be very careful that you know, these are fermions, so now you can only sum over occupation numbers that are zero and one. But otherwise, you know, it goes through the same. And I'm just gonna write the final answer. Yeah, so for a, for a fermion, again, you will have the t equals zero piece, whatever that is, and then minus d3k. I'm actually gonna
Okay, that's not gonna work out, sorry. So I want to have this be small. Okay. Yeah, so it's this okay, and then log of something very similar, except there's a plus here instead of a minus, okay? So, yeah, and so for any sort of, uh, so we're going to, what we're going to consider next is, um, yeah, what the effect of, you know, any particles in the spectrum that couple to our scalar field of interest through, in particular, a mass that depends on, on, the, on the web of phi, uh, as for example is the case in the standard model, how that's going to affect the, the overall free energy of phi and how, you know, symmetry gets restored at high, at high temperatures. So um, just to finish here, uh, as I said, actually, and this is typically also uh, in the literature, typically goes by some J of F, which also depends on the ratio of mass over temperature. So as you can imagine, uh, at very low temperatures, so empty much smaller than one, you can actually expand both of those expressions, and you find that both for the bosons and for fermions, this is actually proportional to e to the minus mass over t, okay? Everything is Boltzmann suppressed. Uh, so finite temperature corrections, as you, as you probably expected, uh, if you are looking at the system at temperatures well below the, the masses of all the various particles are pretty much irrelevant, okay? So we'll start uh, the, our second class later today with what happens at high temperatures, okay? And that's where a lot of more interesting things uh, will, will happen. So that's it for now. Any questions for Isabel? Please. Yeah, I have a question about the um, solid point solution in the context of cosmology. Right. So are you stipulating between some points on a vacuum manifold? Should I be thinking of those vacua as stable or less stable? So that is a great question. And uh, we're going to actually discuss a lot more, uh, that a lot more like in the second lecture today. but. If, um, you know, in the case of a C2 symmetry, for example, uh, what actually happens is, yeah, you end up with some, you know, different Hubble patches because they are not in causal contact. Uh, the field cannot be correlated on, on length scales above the Hubble scale. So you, if you look at various Hubble patches, sometimes in the early universe, uh, the value of the field will be sort of like randomly distributed between, you know, in some region, it will be plus V. In some region, it will be minus, plus, minus, you know, minus. It will be sort of some, some you know, random thing. And then, you know, this will define for you some, like, you know, domain wall network that exists uh, in some, you know, in some manner, okay? And so this is forming the early universe. Uh, and if this is this C2 symmetry is an honest to God symmetry that is only spontaneously broken, then these domain walls are absolutely stable. Uh, they would still be there, as I'll explain later uh, later today. That is actually very ruled out by by cosmology, and we know from from measurements, precision measurements on the CMB, uh, if cos if the main walls were formed at some point in the early universe, it better be that not even one of these guys survives today. So even though you know they could be sort of formally kind of stable uh, in a realistic in any realistic situation, uh, they have to actually decay in some way. Uh, and that's where the, the need for some small amount of symmetry breaking uh, comes in. So for example, you know, a small amount of symmetry breaking due to Planck suppress operators can actually save the day, uh, destroy these things in the early universe. Uh, that leads to interesting signatures in gravitational waves uh, that I will that we mention. But yeah, in principle, you know, as I've discussed it, uh, they could be stable or unstable depending on you know, whether there is more, more breaking of the symmetry or not. Maybe one more question before coffee. If you have like this kind of domain wall network, is it possible that the two different vacuum, like that one of the one region is in one vacuum tunnels the other vacuum, and what happens to the domain wall? Okay, so the question I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, yeah, so the question is like, you know, could it be that there's tunneling between like two regions that are separated by the domain wall? So that depends very much on something I didn't discuss, uh, didn't have time, but. If, let, let's just consider the case of a C2 symmetry, okay? So in the case of a global C2 symmetry, the two vacua at either side of the wall are different vacua. They are related by a global symmetry, but you know, they are otherwise uh, distinct. 
so in that case, that's not possible. Uh, all that can happen is that, you know, maybe, as I, you know, as related to her question, so if instead of these two BACWA being exactly degenerate, one of them was slightly preferred, at some point, one would just dominate, like blow everything else away. Uh, the, the situation is very different, actually, if the C2 symmetry was gauged. Uh, if the C2 symmetry is a gauge symmetry, those two vacua are no longer different vacua. They are actually gauge equivalent. So there is actually no topological obstruction to destroying a domain wall. And what you can actually show, uh, that is a beautiful thing that I assert considered discussing, but there's no time, is that, so C2 gauge theories, uh, if the C2 is spontaneously broken, will they still have domain walls, like here's the domain wall. Uh, but it's a, it's a feature of uh, spontaneous, sorry, it's a feature of gauge discrete symmetries that there must also contain strings. And then what can happen is that a loop, a string loop can actually nucleate and make a hole in the, in the domain wall. Uh, and then because of the string tension, this hole will grow and will just eat the whole wall. Uh, so this is actually what happens in the case of C2 symmetries where there's no topological obstruction because the backward either side are the same. Uh, this is very exponential, I mean, this type of nucleation process is very exponentially suppressed. So actually in the context of cosmology very often, it's kind of like irrelevant, so they behave a little bit more like, uh, like you know, like global domain walls. But yeah, so they're, they're conceptually it's not the same. Yeah, I think we'll stop here and save any other questions for the break. Let's thank Isabel again. Thanks. It's a very nice talk. Thanks. <laughs>